Um, it's a delight to talk to you about Ospreys tonight. I've been uh, working on Ospreys off and on for the last, gee, almost 40 years. So um, um, they are one of my favorites. And they were also, of, uh, as they were, um, of uh, John James Audubon. I think it's always appropriate to start a talk about Ospreys um, with an Audubon painting. Nobody did more to bring Ospreys alive than John James Audubon. They really broke the mold when this guy came along. If you look at bird paintings before Audubon, you'll see that they were um, very rigid and stiff. Um, they weren't nearly as alive uh, and as vibrant as a, a painting um, as, we're seeing, as we're seeing here. And Audubon spoke of ospreys as this famed bird already in Audubon's time. We had uh, ospreys were front and center for people who were paying attention to the natural world. People, especially in America, knew them well because there were so many of them. In Europe, a little bit less um, because they were starting to fade there already by Audubon's time. So what I'd like to do this evening is tell you a little bit about what makes ospreys this famed bird, what it is that's so special about ospreys, and then turn our attention to ospreys around the globe, because we truly are working with a global species here. And for me, that's one of the great uh, sources of fascination with this bird, the fact that it's managed, it's so adaptable and it's managed to colonize so many different habitats in so many different parts of the world. Um, the first thing, of course, about ospreys that, that sets them apart, what is special about ospreys? Well, they're a hawk that fishes. There aren't any other hawks in the world that live exclusively on a diet of, light, of live fish. That's it for ospreys. And so um, you think about some other um, birds of prey that take, um, uh, that take uh, fish. You think of the bald eagle and bald eagles, many relatives, the Haliatus eagles around the globe. Um, and sure, those birds will take fish from time to time, live fish, but they're just as happy dining on a, on a dead moose. And they're just as high, uh, happy sitting on a garbage pile in Alaska and eating what the trucks dump out. Um, I'm always reminded of the great story of Ben Franklin when the US was trying to decide what its national bird this new country was trying to decide what its national bird was going to be. And uh, most people wanted the bald eagle, of course. And um, indeed, we ended up with a bald eagle. But Franklin um, was quite adamant that this was a poor choice. And his, his reasoning was that uh, the bald eagle was a bird, as he said, of low moral character. And uh, uh, ospreys, I'm pleased to say, are not birds of low moral character. Um, and we're going to find out more, um, some of the reasons why that's, why that's so. One of the things that sets ospreys apart is their extraordinary adaptabilities we've talked about. But keep in mind, this is a bird of both fresh and salt water. Those of us who live here on the coast of New England and don't travel much, we tend to think of ospreys as Birds of the coast, birds of the ocean, they're a saltwater bird. You who live there on the shores of Lake Erie nearby or live in Canada, um, you probably think of ospreys as lake and river birds. They're a freshwater bird. It's both. And around the world, um, they have managed to colonize um, a huge variety of different um, water types. Lakes, rivers, bays, uh, estuaries, open, open, open ocean water. Um, they do well in all of those. The other thing that um, is unusual about ospreys is the size of the nest that they build. This happens to be a nest in Western Australia, near Perth in Western Australia. Just think about each, each of those sticks is one trip by the male osprey, bringing that in. There are tens of thousands of sticks in that nest tens of thousands of trips by that male osprey who you see uh, calmly sitting off to the left of the nest there. Very typical um, incubation and pair behavior that you see at this nest here. The female is incubating the male who does all of the foraging for the family and for the female. 
is perched off to the side, although he does take a turn at the nest, just not nearly as much as the female. Nests are, ospreys are fairly gentle birds, gentle hawks, but their nests are one of the few things that they'll, that they'll fight for. The same reason um, when you see a house that you really like and there are 15 other people there, you would do almost anything you could to get those 15 people to disappear so you get the house of your dreams. Ospreys are doing the same thing here. They've put a tremendous amount of work into this nest, hours and hours, weeks, years of building a nest. And so they're not about to, to give it up, although plenty of ospreys will try to um, uh, take over a nest if they can, if they think there's a weak pair that's there. Nest sites tend to be limited for most osprey populations. And so if you get a, if you get a nest, that's your, that's your key to being a successful um, bird, an successful parent and raising lots of young. Quick to adapt. I hardly, if any of you are paying attention to ospreys around your part of the world, you're already seeing that in spades. And um, this goes back in, in history. It's not just today. Here we're seeing a nest, um, a, a modern nest, the today's nest in, that happens to be in, in Germany, in Mecklenburg, Germany, where you have these high tension lines that ospreys adapt to very well. The Germans in this case being Germans have built very precise, very very rigid, durable little um, um, baskets, wire baskets that hold the nest up there um, to get them up above the, uh, the high tension lines. But even in historical times here in New England in the 17 and 1800s, ospreys were adapting to um, uh, artificial platforms that farmers put up in there, near their barns, in their back, in their back pastures so that the ospreys would come in and nests and the ospreys were quite vigilant about keeping the other hawks, the chicken hawks away. And so they kind of became pets of the farmers in New England. If you need any proof that ospreys are succeeding in the world that humans have created, the 20, in 21st century America here, is a ground nesting osprey at JF Kennedy Airport outside of New York City. And these birds produce young year after year after year. One of the reasons they're nesting here is if you look to the right and go half a mile, you end up at Jamaica Bay, which is one of the great wildlife refuges on Long Island. Um, beautiful um, foraging grounds for ospreys, lots of fish, uh, ester and water, shallow, shallow waters um, and uh, ospreys do very, do very well here. Uh, here are the kinds of nest platforms that we build on, on coastal salt marshes here in New England and they've been extraordinarily successful. <clears throat> the point is it doesn't have to be a huge structure to get the birds to nest. In the case of the salt marshes, they really only have to be, you only have to get the nest above high tide and uh, it helps to have some sort of a predator deterrent uh, as, as well. But this is, um, allows for a very good study population. I have a hundred nests like this within a few kilometers of my house and it allows us to, to have a, 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 a terrific study population. I'm able to check 20 or 30 nests in an, af in an afternoon quite easily. Um, one of the <clears throat> artificial sites that ospreys have, 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 have um, have moved onto in a big, big way are um, channel markers and buoys and um, um, any site that is over water maintained by the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard, bless their hearts, have been very accommodating to the ospreys. Chesapeake Bay has the largest concentration of nesting ospreys in the world. It has almost 10,000 pairs. Two thirds of those pairs are nesting on sites like this, either on buoys or on channel markers. So clearly it's been a big boost to the birds and they've taken to them beautifully. They love nesting over water and think about it. It makes great sense. No predator is gonna get to that nest. I mentioned we're dealing with a global species here. Um, and here's a quick look, uh, a quick overview of where ospreys are found. You can see it is most of the Northern Hemisphere and good chunks of the Southern Hemisphere as well. 
There are four subspecies of ospreys that you're seeing here. There's a North American one, um, Carolinensis, that um, breeds all the way from Alaska to Newfoundland and on down into Florida, even into Baja, California, and that winters that winters um, uh, primarily in um, in South America in the in the uh, northern South America, and then there is um, and then there is a European subspecies also migrating, the nominate subspecies Haliatus, and that um, is breeding all through all, all the way from Scotland uh, to uh, Kamchatka and Japan, uh, with birds wintering anywhere from west from Africa on into Southeast Asia. Two non-migratory, two resident subspecies of ospreys, one in, uh, here in Australia and surrounding islands, Cristatus, and one over here in the Caribbean, a very, um, a very small population and quite restricted in its range, Belize in the Yucatan, um, Cuba and the Bahamas. And so there you have it. Um, ospreys have found um, a lot of parts of the world uh, and they're doing very well in most of them. Wasn't always the case. Back in the 1950s, many of you probably know this story, ospreys were on the way out. And um, it was airplanes like this that had a lot to do with it, at least in North America. Um, these were uh, planes that were spraying, particularly here in the East Coast. They were spraying salt, salt marshes for mosquitoes. Um, they were spraying farm, uh, spraying farm fields nearby. DDT, uh, one of the chlorinated hydrocarbons, was the culprit. It had a very specific effect on ospreys and other birds that are at the top of the food, other hawks that are at the top of their food chain, um, it thinned their eggs. So basically ospreys stopped reproducing for about a decade. It probably killed a fair number of adults too. We don't know that for sure, but there's evidence that um, some of the other hydrocarbons were, were um, also having a big impact uh, on ospreys and killing many adults. So here's your, here's your guy, here's your icon. RTP himself was at the forefront. He was living at that point in Old Lyme, Connecticut on the, on the banks of the Connecticut River, surrounded as I am here by ospreys nesting out on salt marshes. And he was one of the first people to sound the alarm because uh, he was a good naturalist. He paid attention and he walked out uh, along the edges of the marshes late in the summer, took a look at the nests and they were all empty. Right away, he knew something was wrong and he was able to ring the bell and get other people involved. Of course, the person who really set this all in motion was Rachel Carson, who, uh, who sounded the alarm about pesticides even before Roger. I'm sure Roger was, was well aware of the impacts, the potential impacts because of people um, like Rachel. I, he was, I'm sure he was friends with her. So quickly, um, thanks to ospreys and many other birds, and thanks to a concerted effort by a whole different, a whole group of different group of people, including um, many of um, um, groups that are now some of the primary environmental law um, uh, groups, uh, people like the Environmental Defense Fund and, and others, through courts and through government uh, action, were able to get DDT banned fairly quickly. So ospreys began to revive by the mid to late 60s. They were starting to come back. And here you see for New York State, the tremendous growth in population. This only takes us up to 2015. There are almost twice as many ospreys now in New York State as there were in 2015. So you can see it's really exponential growth, fantastic growth of this population. And it's not just growth in numbers, it's a change in distribution which I find especially fascinating. Here we are in 1985, about a decade or a decade and a half into the recovery. And you'll see that most of the ospreys in New York state were down in Eastern Long Island. I was down studying those birds. They were some of the first ospreys that I got to work with. There was a small population up here in the Adirondacks and just a tiny number in the rest of, in the, rest of the state. By 2005, and this is, clearly way outdated, but it shows you already how the ospreys were starting to not only move west in Long Island and colonize the entire um, um, length of Long Island, but also move into the Finger Lakes and some of the lakes around Syracuse and then down in your territory down here where 
there was actually a hacking program that <clears throat> brought ospreys uh, in there in the in the 80s and the 90s. By now, especially the finger legs, um, I'm going to skip this, but especially uh, the finger legs were um, uh, one of the um, primary um, areas where ospreys have recolonized Western New York, and we'll get into that in a bit. In terms of Long Island, there was one especially interesting island off the coast of Long Island, Gardner's Island, that historically, before DDT, had the largest osprey colony in the world, 300 pairs, many of them nesting on the ground because it was a, an area that was free of mammalian predators, so the ospreys could nest on the ground and they didn't have to worry about their eggs and their young being eaten. They also nested in wind-blown trees. This was a famous colony. It was written about by, by many different people. People came from Europe to see this colony. Uh, here they are nesting on the beach, building these big nests along the beach. And what's happened on Long Island and uh, in my part of the world and starting to be some in your part of the world is this shift over to nesting platforms that are built particularly for the ospreys. They take to them very readily and um, they can be, uh, uh, they can have predator guards put into on, onto them so uh, raccoons and uh, fisher cats and other predators can't climb them. This one happens to be a metal pole, so it doesn't need a predator guard. So bottom line, we've got ospreys back again in a big, big way. I can make a, just a quick segue and talk to you a little bit about the Finger Lakes, because for me, it was a hugely interesting um, osprey story, uh, um, particularly in the, last, in the last decade. The growth there has been phenomenal. I grew up in the Finger Lakes. I was a kid there in the 50s and the 60s, and I never saw an osprey. There wasn't an osprey nest. Um, if there were ospreys nesting in the Finger Lakes, they were doing a really good job of hiding. Nobody has any records of ospreys nesting there, even historically, up until um, really the last 15 to 20 years. Um, and then they moved into areas like Montezuma, the National Wildlife Refuge, where they nested <clears throat> on high tension lines, and then started to moving down Cayuga Lake, where they found wonderful nesting sites on, the, um, on the, the, uh, the power poles that had double cross arms on them. Candace Cornell, who many of you may have listened to the other evening, she gave a talk um, for your group here uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, I encourage you to go back and, and hear her talk if you missed it, because that will give you the full story. But the bottom line is from essentially zero pairs, the Finger Lakes has almost 150 nests now. It had 130 active nests in the past year. Two years before that, it had fewer than 100. So the growth is just explosive there. And it's a combination of great nest sites, um, shallow water with quite a few new fish coming in, um, uh, particularly um, some invasive species, which can be a problem for, of course, for the ecosystem. But as far as the ospreys are concerned, invasive fish taste just as good as regular ones. So there they are, they're back in a world part of the landscape. And um, what I'd like to do now is move you, move you across the ocean and start thinking about what hap what's happening to ospreys in other parts of the world. When I give this talk, particularly when I give it in person, I always offer a case of beer, a free case of beer to anybody who can read, pronounce correctly, and give a correct translation for any one of the words on this, uh, on this placard. This, we're in Finland. And Finland is one of those weird languages that is um, related to Hungarian. And uh, it's one of those um, uh, odd European languages that is only found in a handful of, a handful of places. But it has a very strong um, osprey program and people who are doing a lot of good work there. I was lucky enough to visit there when I was doing research for my book about six to eight years ago, and um, and met with my uh, and visited and stayed with my osprey colleagues and got to see what ospreys are doing in Finland. This is very typical of the habitat, very very different than what we see here in North America. These are ospreys are forest birds in this part of the world. They don't nest in any kind of um, clusters the way they do here. The nests are quite far apart and um, they have to find just the right tree. There's a good reason they're far apart. They're, most trees don't work for them. They have to find just the right tree 
in which they can build a nest. The fins are helping um, by um, building uh, platforms such as you see here at the top of this tree. We'll see more of that in a bit. A quick look at, at um, the overall range of, um, Europe's, of Europe's ospreys. We've got um, a population here in Scotland that's just recovering. Um, small populations in Central Europe and, uh, and in Germany. The heart of osprey territory is in the big boreal forest, very much equivalent of the Canadian boreal forest um, here in Scandinavia, uh, Norway, uh, Sweden especially, Sweden holds most of Europe's ospreys, and, and Finland. Um, so here we, here we have Finland and on into Eastern Russia and some of the Baltic, some of the Baltic countries. As I mentioned, the Finns build nests and they don't mess around. They don't just put up a platform and walk away. They build the entire nest for the osprey. They line it with the material that should be in there. So when the ospreys come back, they have no excuse not to settle right in. And indeed they do. I think over 50% of the ospreys in Finland are nesting on platforms like this, which are built in live trees. So they're not putting up artificial platforms, they're just building a platform in a tree in a good, in a good location. A quick reminder that at these, this is far, far north at these latitudes, um, there's pretty much midnight sun, ospreys can, can, um, can hunt, can forage, can get fish 24, almost 24 hours a day, which no doubt helps them. One of my great friends and colleagues there, Perti Sorla, he's, a, he's the Finnish osprey guru. He's abandoned more ospreys than any person in, in the world and uh, in an area where there aren't that many ospreys and you have to really work to get your ospreys to band. I think Perti's banded over 10,000 10, ospreys. Here he is, 77 years old. He's still climbing pine trees to get to the osprey nest. This is a this is the kind of, this is what makes Perti's day. There he is, another osprey, another osprey bandit. He's, he's now 82, I think, and I think he's still climbing trees. This is part of what keeps people like Perti going in Scotland. Um, one of my great delights when I was there, we were staying in, everybody in Sk Finland has a lake cottage and it's very simple. Most of them don't have electricity, it's pump water. But all of them, all of them have what you see here, a sauna. And so you come back at the end of a long day. We were spending long days in the field. We we're recovering a lot of miles. You'd come back and, and Perti's wonderful wife, Hel Hemuli, had already gotten the sauna going, bless her heart. And there we was, we would pile into the sauna at the end of the day and then jump in the lake. It was totally restorative. Reminder, two things that um, osprey chicks are cute and um, that they look, osprey chicks around the world look pretty much the same. Here you notice this egg in the middle, it's got a little hole. This is uh, an osprey chick that hasn't yet made it out of the egg. It's just pipping, what's called pipping. It's coming out of the egg. And note that um, you have <clears throat> a runting system here. It's just like puppies. Some puppies get born before others, and the puppies that get born early are the top dogs. The same thing with, uh, with ospreys. If you get a, a food shortage in the nest, unfortunately, you do not want to be that third hatched osprey. They survive much less well, and they get pounded on by their older, tougher siblings. The Finns have done a wonderful job of educating people about ospreys, bringing ospreys to the, to the general public. And this is true throughout Europe. Um, very impressive, uh, the, the educational aspects of their, of their pro osprey project here. And here you see um, their osprey center, their Finnish osprey center, which is built on the, on the shores of an old trout hatchery. Three guesses and the first two don't count why you would build your osprey center on the edge of a trout hatchery. They took over the trout hatchery. They seed every day. They put fresh trout in these ponds and the ospreys come from miles around 
needless to say. They're not dumb. They find the fish. They find where the fish are. And people rent these little hides, these little blinds. These are photography blinds. People come literally from around the world. When I was there, there were photographers from Japan, from Russia, and from Canada who were renting for considerable amounts of money, were renting a chair in that blind so that they could get photos like that when the ospreys come in to eat their trout. And all of that money goes to fund the Finnish osprey project. England and Scotland has an equally interesting story and a lot <clears throat> of interesting history. Um, ospreys were essentially, um, ospreys are nesting just like they do in Finland, back in deep forests in, on high dead trees. And, uh, but historically, um, ospreys have been nesting like this for a long time, but historically ospreys were wiped out of Scotland. By the 1920s and 30s and 40s, there wasn't a nesting osprey to be found, or if there was, there were only one or two. So they went from hundreds of pairs. There were never a huge population there. Um, they went from hundreds of pairs to zero. The reason were very different than why we lost our ospreys here in North America. Pesticides were a bit of an issue, but not nearly as much. Instead, these birds were shot and trapped. They were seen as pests, as vermin. The English and the Scot especially um, love their fish. They want to protect their fish. Ospreys were coming in and taking their fish, especially trout at large estates. These estates had the wealthy landowners, had uh, gamekeepers, and the gamekeeper's job was to make sure that no ospreys were around to get uh, to get the trout. So they essentially shot them, but they also were very good at trapping them. They put large per perches up by the, by the trout ponds and the trout rivers, and the ospreys would come in and perch on that, and, and there would be traps on those perches. These are the kind of people that were doing that thing, that, those sorts of things. They've now changed their tune, I'm pleased to say, and the large landholders in England and Scotland, and keep in mind that landholding and Europe is very different than it is in North America. 90% of our large holdings, think of, think of the West, think of the West of the Mississippi, all of the big, big, big holdings of open wild land are owned by the government. National parks, national forests, Department of Defense, Defense owns vast areas of the West. Um, here in England and Scotland, very different. This, particular, the, the family that lives in this um, uh, chateau castle has lived in it for almost 800 years and they have over 100,000 acres of forest, huge, huge holdings and the ospreys are nesting in there. And because these people have deep pockets and don't have to cut the forest, they are protecting the land for wildlife like ospreys and, and many other species as well. So it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting um, study in, in, land own, in land ownership, very different than what we have here. Some of my gardening friends uh, see this uh, photo here and, um, um, and they just look so sad because they say, my garden doesn't look like that, how come? And I tell them, your garden would look like that if you had 25 people that showed up at eight o'clock every morning to go to work in your garden and they work there all day. That's exactly how these gardens look so nice. There are a lot of people working on them. Beautiful landscapes surrounding these areas. This is um, both rivers and locks. This is a lock, which is an estuary, an arm of the sea that comes into the land. This is salt water. A lot of it very shallow water, perfect for ospreys. They catch a lot of flounder here. They also catch a lot of trout in nearby rivers, um, and they do, and they do very well. Here again, we find an osprey center. This one is famous, the Lock Garden Osprey Center. Over 1 million people have been to visit this. This was set up at one of the first nests when ospreys started to come back to Scotland. It was set up by the RSPB, which is the, the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. 
the British equivalent of their of our Audubon Society, and they built a center. They built a, a nest and a nesting platform and protected it. And um, they've done a tremendous job of keeping these ospreys safe. Keep in mind, there are still people that think ospreys are a problem. Um, and there are still people that want osprey eggs. Egg collectors were another big problem for ospreys historically. People would come in and steal the eggs. They were worth a lot of money. They could sell them. That still happens today a little bit. So they have to guard many of the nests, which of course just seems crazy to us here, uh, but it still happens a bit in Europe. Again, phenomenal growth, not quite as strong as we've seen in North America, but still um, very good. They're now well over 300 uh, pairs of ospreys in um, not only in Scotland, but uh, together, with, together with England. This is the guy, as so often is the case, there's one or two people who make a lot of this happen. This is Roy Dennis, has his own wildlife foundation, has been a real a champion of ospreys in, in the UK for, for many years, going back to the, <clears throat> the first nest that came in. Lovely man, and has done tremendous work. Ospreys first colonized Scotland. They weren't working their way down into, into England, and so people decided to to take the bull by the horns and to make sure that ospreys found their way into England. And what they did is took young from Scotland before they fledged and did what's called hacking. They transferred them down, they moved them down to parts of England where the ospreys had nested historically near bodies of water and, um, and uh, hacked them out as young birds and fed them until they became established and could fly. And, and then when they were, were fledged and moving around, this is the area that they imprinted on. So when they came back from their migrations, they didn't go to Scotland, they came back to the area in England where they had done their final, their final growth. There's a water, a water, a reservoir water company in this area that has done a tremendous job, poured a lot of money into building a nature center around ospreys and other life and other wildlife. <clears throat> Um, and very sustainable farming farming practices. They've pioneered with uh, with farms in the surrounding area. They've just done a terrific job. It really is um, a, a model for public private uh, partnerships in making wildlife um, uh, programs happen. And what ospreys, as I mentioned, have been a big part. Here are some of these young birds that were brought down from Scotland. You can see they're wearing they're wearing uh, color bands that will identify them when they when they come back. Why did it do that? Nope. Here we go. Um, and um, um, and they've set up uh, blinds where people can watch the nests and, and photograph the ospreys and they take notes on all the nests. They've also done a lot of work on, on studying migration. And here you see an osprey that's been fitted with a little harness and a satellite, uh, a satellite transmitter. This is a solar powered satellite transmitter that provides GPS locations for each bird that is wearing it, a unique um, idea, a unique signature for each bird. Um, and, and the UK, the British, the British and other parts of Europe um, helped pioneer this and did a terrific job uh, getting, this, getting this started. And <clears throat> you get very, very interesting re results by being able to follow uh, really for the first time, being able to follow an osprey, not only as it forages in, its, in the area where it's breeding, but also on its long migration. Here's a typical migration for ospreys. These are from Finland, but they could easily be from Scotland or Sweden or other parts of Europe. Typical migration um, of ospreys going to, of um, uh, uh, Scandinavian and European ospreys going to West Africa, which is where most of them winter. This is an interesting case because two, two, the osprey, two ospreys whose tracks you see here were a mated pair. So both ospreys from one nest were, um, were followed in their migrations. And you see a lot of interesting things here. First of all, they're taking slightly different routes. They are not flying the same route to get to Africa. Um, and that's understandable. The females leave actually quite a bit earlier than the males do. The males race to all the raising of the young at the end. 
of the last few weeks. The females, um, the females uh, uh, take off. They've lost a lot of weight. They need to regain that. You can also see how they've cr how they're crossing water here. They're crossing the Mediterranean Sea. But notice how they are using as much land as they can. They're um, flying through Italy and Sicily, in this case, and Sardinia and Corsica, in this case. They're ending up and they take slightly different routes. I think red is the is spring migration and the blue is fall migration. So they're taking slightly different routes, spring and fall, but not, not that different. Above all, they're wintering in totally different areas. Ospreys migrate alone, including their young. They do not migrate as a pair. They don't migrate as a family. The young don't migrate together. Each osprey is on its own. So as my friend Rob Beregard likes to joke, ospreys who are known to mate for life, at least many of them, some of them, he said, maybe, maybe, maybe the secret to ospreys being able to stay together for life is that they take separate winter vacations. Think about what these ospreys have to cross to get from the north, from the southern Mediterranean to West Africa. This is what, as soon as they get across the Mediterranean, almost immediately, this is what they hit: the Sahara. It's four. It's a four or a five-day flight across the Sahara. Needless to say, not a lot of fish. How do ospreys do it? They do it on fat. They build up fat supplies and they burn fat which is, of course, how almost all birds accomplish long-distance migrations. If you can't stop and feed all the time, you are having to burn fat. For our ospreys, um, um, and of course, European ospreys that are cr crossing the Mediterranean, you, you also have periods where you have to fast when you're crossing water. Our ospreys are going, um, and by our, our ospreys, I'm saying mostly the eastern, eastern North America, are migrating over for at least 24 hours um, over, the Carib over the Caribbean. They're flying, most of them down the East Coast, through Florida, across to Cuba, and then from uh, Cuba moving over into Haiti, moving east into Haiti and Hispaniola, and from there jumping off uh, across the Caribbean for a 24-hour flight to south to northern south america and this is a lot how they do it they tend to fly low they're obviously doing it on um, uh, on whatever body reserves they have fat fat and muscle and uh, if a hurricane comes along we, we lose a, we lose a lot of ospreys but if it doesn't these are routine flights for them they can fly 24 hours day and night clouds or no clouds they are finding their way across trackless expanses of water. Think about it. Perhaps it's somewhat understandable for adults who have done it before. Think about a juvenile osprey, your ospreys that are leaving your nests in September and are flying down to Florida, Cuba, Hispaniola, knowing where to go, and then jumping off south across the Caribbean, knowing exactly how to navigate across that vast expanse of water at night to South America. Back to Africa, this is in West, this is in um, where ospreys end up, uh, typical habitat where they end up along the coasts of, uh, of, of West Africa. They share these waters with, um, um, with indigenous fishermen there, with folks who are, um, uh, are small-scale fishermen. Unfortunately, um, in, in recent times, uh, uh, Chinese uh, industrial fishing by Chinese boats have taken have started to take over in these waters, uh, and it could have a big impact. We're 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 worried about what uh, the impacts might be not only on fishermen like this, but on the ospreys who have to share uh, the fish that are there. Here here's another painting by Julie Zikafus. The water crossing that you saw was also a Zikafus painting. One of your, your neighbor there in Ohio, maybe you know Julie. If you haven't met her, you should get her to come and give a talk. She gives a fabulous talk. Um, and here, she, here one of her paintings of ospreys uh, perched along the, taken from a photograph, perched along the beaches of Senegal. In the background, donkey carts. Um, these are 
are, um, are, are highways, they're thoroughfares for people, for trade, for people bringing uh, goods um, from village to village along these beaches. The Brits have done a fantastic job of linking schools um, in Scotland and England with schools in Africa using ospreys as the common coin. And here you see a high school class in Senegal, West Africa that is learning via the internet about ospreys in uh, Scotland and England. And at the same time, the Scottish high school classes are learning what osprey life is like on the beaches of, Sen of Senegal. So indeed, we have a bird here um, that uh, does a fabulous job of linking continents and cultures. It would be a great project for the Roger Torrey Peterson Institute to think about pulling together. Um, and Roger Torrey Peterson would be beaming from his grave if you were able to make this happen. Um, uh, linking up with um, some high schools in uh, parts of perhaps um, Colombia or Brazil, or um, I'd love to say Venezuela, but I wouldn't try that today. Um, but you, you get the idea, find, find a high school there um, in areas where we know ospreys are spending the winter and um, see if you can es an es establish a, a, a linkage between the, between the two high schools. Ospreys are a great way for to get people talking in different parts of the world. I mentioned a little bit about um, how ospreys are being brought back to new and different areas. Spain is a perfect example of a hacking project where ospreys have been brought from Sweden and uh, young ospreys before they can fly have been brought from Sweden and Scotland and put in these, um, they build these uh, large sort of cages and they're fed there um, and um, as soon as they can fly, the cages are opened up and the birds are able to fly around. Their food, they continue to have food um, given to them until they are totally independent and it works beautifully. Spain has now a population of almost a hundred pairs of ospreys that were, that grew from this nucleus of young birds that were brought from different parts of Europe. So here we have um, various parts of Europe helping out other parts that are trying to get their ospreys back. So there we have it. We've got um, ospreys around the world. We've got a whole new new generation of ospreys coming on, on, on board in, in, um, in a big way in lots of parts of, in lots of parts of the world, especially in our, around our, uh, around our area here in the, in the eastern in the eastern US. Um, anybody who's going to be paying attention is going to see more and more ospreys. In their, in their neighborhood, and it's a wonderful thing. In an era when so many birds are struggling to keep going, uh, it's nice to have a bird that turns out to be a winner, that turns out to be so highly adaptable that it is able to fit into our world, even though we're changing it uh, in lots of ways that are, are harmful for, for other, other parts of the biosphere. Ospreys can remind us that with a little bit of work, a little bit of effort, a little bit of help, um, we can make a big difference of bringing a species back from the brink and having it become part of our lives.